Good evening and welcome to Talking Songs with me, Roland Jones. You probably only caught about three seconds of that intro there. My uh, my Mac decided that it wasn't in any particular hurry. So instead of seeing a lots of flashing and gaudy images of things, you probably saw about four. Anyway, despite that, we're here. So um, welcome to uh, another edition of Talking Songs with me, Roland Jones. And... Um, I've got some very interesting guests sometimes. Well, I've always got interesting guests on the great people. But um, tonight is, is, a, is a particularly interesting one for me. Um, but in the meantime, I shall uh, play you a song. See, this is the problem when you have interesting guests. What happens is there's like about five or ten minutes before we actually go on air and we start chatting. And then you suddenly realise, oh, we should be on air by now. And we're not. Does anybody else feel like me that it doesn't really seem to be August? See, in, um, in Italy by this stage, it's, it's past Ferragosto, it's past the 14th of August, and now the summer is officially over. And we haven't even started. Well, that's not strictly true. We, were, we had a few days of glorious sunshine. Um, okay, this is a song called... Um, in those eyes. That very first look, that very first smile didn't take a minute I knew as our paths crossed In that moment I was totally lost In those eyes In those eyes I could see it all so clearly together every day closer and closer in every way no longer two separate people two halves of the one soul eyes in those eyes I could see it all so clearly in those eyes suddenly it all vanished the spell was broken the magic had gone I could see, I could feel, but it was different. There was someone there, but the lights were on. In those eyes, in those eyes, I could see it also. I remember the last time I saw you You look beautiful Just not the same I could see you remembered All that had happened And how it fell apart No fault, no blame eyes in those eyes I could see it all so clearly in those eyes in those eyes in those eyes 
I could see it all so clearly in those eyes. I guess you hadn't guessed that's called in those eyes. Um, okay, so this um, this band. Um, I came across them some time ago. They contacted me about a gig that uh, I was running at the time. And um, unfortunately, due to the, the nature of, uh, or the multifarious ways in which we can get in touch over um, the internet these days, what with WhatsApp and email and messenger and messages and not, I kind of lost their, um, <laughs> lost their message. And, um, Anyway, I came across it again the, about two weeks ago and um, they did undersell themselves something dreadfully, I have to say. Um, just it, 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 they didn't say anything about what the music was, what they did. They were, and I thought this is going to be quite interesting because most people send me stuff that says they are the best things in sliced bread or, or whatever the, the appropriate metaphor is. These guys didn't. Um, so I checked them out. And I found these songs on Spotify, which were just extraordinary. Um, I very much, I can understand why they didn't describe them because there is no way of describing them. So without further ado, as they say, I shall introduce into the studio, the Blazing Ooh. Snowmen. Ooh. Oh, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> Officially three quarters of the blazing snowmen. Three quarters, seventy-five percent blazing snowmen. Uh, um well welcome chaps. Phil oh, Phil and Eddie. Um nice. so yeah, what okay, let's start from the obvious question. Why blazing snowmen? Uh well, you have to start at the beginning, I suppose, because we're good place to start. Several name changes. Uh in fact, just to give some context, Eddie and I first met uh, i'd only left school uh that summer of 1982 so next year we 40 years uh, mm. that we'll, we'll have been writing together and um ed had very much a punk ethic so mm. really uh, as a trio at the beginning uh, anything that we brought without any kind of discussion we would kind of slot in together we were mm. quite avant-garde in fact we were called the avant-gardeners <laughs> And then we met more people. Uh, there was a, a, a chap that got involved, Steve Davis, not the snooker raves, by the way, mm. who was working in finance, and he suggested a kind of business title, implied consent. Uh, so that's what we were. In fact, uh, that was uh, the band when we had our first single out in 83, 84. Right. Um, uh, and then uh, that kind of drifted apart. We became, Ed, Ed and I continued to play as a duo. Mm called barge pole we'd reached the point where we thought no one is touching us with one <laughs> but we were very lucky uh, we worked uh, collaborated with some really interesting musicians we had a, a group of indian musicians that we worked with on an album for a while some excellent musicians and we continued in that vein until we thought actually we've got to make a, a, a statement here we've, we've got to define who we are yeah so it was some vague memory of reading about some east german pagan ritual of setting fire to wooden snowmen on will winter solstice right kind of stuck really and we so like, met it's like the wicker man a winter version of yeah, the wicker man yeah, sort of yeah kind of germanic uh, equivalent of that and phil met us uh, at one of the gigs we were we were running alternative cabaret nights in the early 90s in manchester right and Phil's band was one of the book, the acts that we booked. That was about 25 years ago, I think we first met. Yeah. Uh, and we've stayed the Blazing Snowmen since then, and uh, it's um, found fame and fortune, of course. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You've never looked back. No, <laughs> you don't look back. <laughs> No, it's looked, it's a, it's a sort of paraphrase, looked back in hunger, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very good, very good. And we've got a few, we've got comments flooding in here. They've got five comments. Who have we got? Pietro Antonino. Um, I don't know who that is. Um, Susanna Regazzini is um, uh, a friend of <laughs> me and Leslie's from when we used to live in, in Italy. And she always tunes in. I don't know who Pietro Antonino is. 
But there you go. You've, got, you've already got an international audience with me. Oh, so. oh, fantastic. You know, you can't. Well, we didn't have a Finnish drummer, so that was quite erudite, really. <laughs> yeah, when you, I thought it was quite funny actually. It's like um, it, it, it reminded me a little bit of. Um, of ZZ Top, you know, when you have two people famous for their beards and then the third member is called Mr. Beard. Um, oh, yeah. I thought it was Phil, Phil, yeah. Eddie and Henrik. Did you say his name is? Is that right? Hi, yeah. Henrik. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Henrik. Yeah, so, hi, Henrik. yeah, I feel sorry. Why, why have we left him out? Oh, it's just because he's a drummer. Well, he's, he's, he's safer from, outside. He's just back from Finland. Yeah, he's right. returned from a family trip. And uh, uh, plus also, we uh, Henrik isn't thin enough to squeeze in this Tiny little slot, yeah. Webcam, <laughs> although he does have a very small kit, right? That sounds very personal. Um, I've just, I've just still got a, a, a message here from Pietro saying, I recorded your best song. Now, Ooh. is it which one? Would that be? Oh, I tell, I tell you, whether it may, maybe it's actually, it might be an, an engineer that I worked with thinking about it from um. From one of the colleges in Manchester. Anyway, I digress. Okay, guys, I think we should. Should we have a song? Sure. Now, th th I would say at this point that what fascinated me about these guys was the lyrics, and um, I think I think I said it reminded me a bit of the Divine Comedy. Um, so th there must. Uh, yes, it is Pietro. Ciao, Pietro. Grazie. Mi dispiace che non sapevo chi Allora, um, I uh, I was intrigued by the lyrics, so. Can you tell us that there must be a story behind your lyrics in this in every song? So what's the what's the score on this one? The story on this is about obsessive love, and if you look at it on a spectrum, at the worst end of sadistic, murderous stalkers, to the other end of the spectrum uh, of adolescent obsessives, which is mm -hmm. where I began. Um, I made the mistake of actually having a crush on this girl, Debbie, but. Rule number one in the Stalker's Handbook is never follow anyone who lives in a cul-de-sac. <laughs> of course, you have to turn around again. and <laughs> You can't pretend. You can't pretend, no. Uh, and this is a universal experience that everyone goes through, this feeling that we dance, reveal our true feelings, and it becomes an act of treachery. Right. Well, if, 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 as you said that, I was reminded of what was the the, the punk single about? Uh, Am I in love with a girl on the on the Superstore checkout? Was yeah. That, yeah. Was Chris that the Buzzcocks? No, uh, it was no, the Chris Seavey. Chris Seavey, yeah. Yeah. Frank exactly. Sidebottom. Yeah. Pre Frank, pre Frank Sidebottom. Yeah. 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 What was his band? The Freshies. The Freshies. Sorry. Freshies. Yeah. Wow. Gosh, we're look, we're reminiscing already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, what this? What what was the title again? Uh, unrequited. Unrequited. Yeah, John Taylor Clark said, "I've got uh, amnesia and deja vu. I can't remember what happens next." <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, take it away, guys. Okay. Four, one, three, four. Nobody knows the little crushes that I must suppress. To spare these blushes, I dare not confess. To make it real is lunacy. No one could guess. Nobody knows the hidden secrets that are all contained. The sudden impulse that I still refrain from acting out. To cross the line would be insane Do fantasies make me guilty of such treachery? Duplicity is the crime that makes it willful But what the hell, there's no betrayal Nobody knows I pay attention to the slightest clue the little details where I take my cue The glimpse is all I ever crave One look from you Nobody knows All the silly words I can't express I build a monument to loneliness Your devotee who 
losing hope all I possess. Do fantasies make me guilty of such treachery? Duplicity is the crime that makes it willful. But what the hell? There's no betrayal, no audit trail, no request for bail. Exquisite though it feels, mad as it seems, it morally bankrupt. I need nerves of steel. If I reveal, I my own self destruct, self destruct. Cursed like in some Greek mythology. Passion so sublime. This could spread into pathology. Shift this paradigm. Squandering my time. Obsession's not a crime. Excellent. I love the the rhyme of disrupt. Dis destruct with bankrupt. Nice. I'm, I'm, I have to say, I've never come across the the expression morally bankrupt in a song before. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a good point, actually. After <laughs> that one. <laughs> um, what I mean, you you, you talked about punk that, uh, earlier on. Who who did you particularly? Because I mean, punk to me covers a whole range of different things. You know, from from the out and out pistol stuff and the buzzcocks and. And then you've got the jam that evolved into something a lot more sophisticated. Um, what, where, where did you come from? I was in a punk band um, many, many years ago called mm. um, Crawling Chaos. Right. And we were on factory, the factory label in the very yeah. early days. Yep. Um, and the whole thing about it was that it was all self-made. We did everything ourselves. We've made, apart from cutting the records, we mm. did t-shirts uh, got our own gigs uh, yeah. sold our records and, um, and it was the ethos of punk that really really sort of drove me to sort of get into music mm. at the time i had really long hair and i was your typical hippie mm. and I, I went to see a, a, a little punk band you know just a local punk band mm. and uh, it was mind-blowing <laughs> <laughs> I thought at last, you know, there's something here I can actually have a go at. You, previous to that, you know, it was all prog rock and you had to be technically brilliant to be in mm. Punk came along and opened the door for every bedroom musician. It, well, it didn't even have to be musicians in some cases. You know? Many of them weren't. Yes. <laughs> and proved it. Yeah, yeah. So it was a, it was a, a baptism of fire, but it was... Um, Mm. I have to say, when you say the, the long hair hippie bit, because I, I, I fell into that category, and I, I do somewhere have a um, um, an, an invitation to um, the Speakeasy in London, um, you know, one of the sort of cards that gives you what all the gigs were on, and it was a yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and uh, Monday was the Stranglers, um, Wednesday was the Sex Pistols, and we were on on the Tuesday, yeah. and we were doing like sort of West Coast <laughs> American country rock sort of stuff. It, yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. I always used to say that we were swamped by the new wave rather than riding on it, but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but clearly, clearly you've, you've emerged strong and thrusting. Um, yeah. the, the interesting thing for me is also the, 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 the style, because, I mean, certainly you don't sing like a punk band. Yeah. Um, so it, so we, we're talking ethos rather than start with musical much. style. Very much so. You know, you can do it yourself. And me and Phil have, um, you know, played some horrendous venues, you know, where where people want you off. But mm. that, that punk ethos keeps you going, you know. Yeah. You know, we've, where was it we played the netball teams? Oh, oh well, I mean, we did a, a pub in Oldham. It was the, a friend of ours decided he wanted to be our manager. So he booked us a gig at this pub it happened to coincide with the women's women net, netball team uh, <laughs> celebration and they had no clue about what they were booking and at the time um i think it was when we were still a duo and we were doing a range of punk covers on on acoustic and our own stuff and people mm. 
that to us to say, are you allowed to swear, by the way, on... <laughs> how, how moderate do we have to be? Moderately, <laughs> yes. Well, swear with irony. <laughs> yeah, he said, you are really shit. And I said, well, that's your opinion, and, and I really appreciate you being honest with us. But by the first half, we were pleading with a landlady, should we just go? She said, well, <laughs> you may as well carry on. But we run out of songs, so we just played the same song, same set again twice as fast. But they were so pissed by the end of the night. Uh, they they enjoyed it. Playing uh, simply the best. But we, of course, we didn't know it. But we just kind of got dragged along. This was one of many occasions where we were um, inappropriately performing. But yeah. We've always stayed true to ourselves. We just believe <laughs> in what we do. That's and if brilliant. people like us, that's fantastic. And if they don't, then they have something to tell the grandkids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you, 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 you said earlier about being signed to Factory, do you remember a band called Fast Breeder? Um, I've, ne I've never come across them, but I know the name. Because um, the, there was a guitar player in it called Dave, who, um, who who I knew quite well, and we went to see them, and it would have been like the Jubilee in 1977, whatever it was. Yeah. And um, it was a gig up in North Manchester, and um, uh, what I do remember that they, I mean, <laughs> we were there because we knew what they did, but nobody else in the place knew what happened. And eventually, the thing that t climaxed the whole thing as a punk experience was that at a certain point the police arrived and took them off stage and arrested them for <laughs> illegal possession of drugs. At which point I will never forget Dave shouting, society is to blame, as he was carried away by two policemen. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Those were the days, my friend, as they say. <laughs> but yeah, I... <laughs> Sorry? That would have been a badge of honour. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, it was, uh, yes, funny days. Um... Okay, so where, where, what's been happening since then? There's been a few years have, have passed, and you're still writing. You were talking to me we're earlier still about... We're, uh, we're, we're very lucky to have the, the lineup that we have, and what has endured all these years is it's friendship that, that has kept going. We could have been fishing enthusiasts or <laughs> cars, but it just happened to be music. Yeah. And it's, there's never been any egos involved or any kind of formula. It's just really been friends sharing music and just being curious about what we can produce. So that in itself, there's mm -hmm. never been a goal really to um, to seek fame and fortune, but it mm -hmm. has sustained us over the years and it's allowed us, it's given us that freedom to just to keep creating, just experimenting, seeing what we can come up with next mm -hmm. rather than grinding to a halt and just repeating the same formula. Mm -hmm. It keeps it fun. It keeps yeah. it so what, what, is, is there a way in which, you know, it, 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 your most recent song, how did it come about? Who, who, who came with the first? Was it something that emerged out of jamming or was it somebody came along with a line or, or what? Usually Phil comes with, with the, the lyrics and um, a semi-structure of the, of the, the um, song and then mm. puts it to the band. Mm. And we, we try and embellish it and mm. take it that way occasionally we'll we'll um work on sketches you know i'll i maybe just do a piano piece or something mm. and mm. next to the band will take it and manipulate it but it's all very very um within the band you mm. know? yeah we, we we've done a lot more of that recently so we collaborate and mm. uh, the next song it was created out of a collaboration that took quite a few months uh, we like it to ferment. Mm. Uh, it's a bit like dry stone walling, really. You keep finding <laughs> the right size rock, the right shape of rock until you've got the wall, really. Right. Uh, but that's the luxury of not uh, being under pressure of time. Um, so it makes it interesting. So we're all involved to some mm. degree. Yeah, and we do recordings of jam sessions sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. If there's yeah. something promising, we'll that's right. try and nurture it a bit yeah you get a phrase or a chord sequence or something yeah and fit things together that seem to go together that's right i think it's, one, from... it's wonderful that we have this this situation here where you can actually use a metaphor and say the music is like dry stone walling <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant well they stay, they stay up for hundreds of years dry stone walls. <laughs> absolutely yeah. and take a long time to make in the first place they do. Yes. that's right <laughs> Excellent. So, was it? Should we have another song? What do you reckon? Sure. Which one is it? Uh, this song. Actually, we, we didn't intend to select mostly love songs, but it's just how we've how they've turned out. And this is another version of 
love song really because this is a story about when a, a couple haven't chosen the conventional path hmm. and kind of had a more of a an anarchistic attitude to relationship right uh so it's really the pinnacle I, the irony of having then become cohabiting in a 30s semi mm. and actually appreciating it for what it is which is suburban utopia right uh, and this it, the song is called ideal home exhibitionists <laughs> excellent <laughs> Is it a, 
um, a, a true reference. I've got this vague, vague recollection of H.G. Wells's life being a bit like that, that he lived in a, a very suburban um, home county's surroundings, yeah. but in fact wasn't married to his partner yeah. and um, was, was a, a raging socialist. Um, and actually hated all that, all that stuff. I mean, yeah. apparently the reason he wrote War of the Worlds was the fact that he wanted to destroy Surrey. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as as he was writing it, he was he was actually on a, on a cycling holiday on the Thames, and at some point he was writing postcards to his to his friends, and he wrote one message that said, um, uh, "Today, I've destroyed Woking." <laughs> So anyway, sorry, I digress, but it would just strike me as being um, a, a slightly related, I mean, slightly off key. Now, coming back to the, the songs, now, like, as, as a songwriter, I, like many songwriters, probably most songwriters, tend to write about, you know, um, interactions between people, interactions mm -hmm. in situations, but yours are, without any shadow of doubt, left field. And... It just intrigues me as to where that where that came from. I mean, I understand that the punk thing, but if you th if most punk songs aren't aren't left field in that sense, yeah, that that's true. Uh, it, they have developed, uh, and mm. obviously, you, you have to have life experience and maturity to know what you want to write about. And yeah, yeah. Teenager, I was writing all kind of stuff, weird stuff. When Ed, when I was seventeen, he said, "Can you write a song about eating babies?" And I thought, <laughs> "Okay, I'll give that a go," but I don't. <laughs> Experience. I can just see the conversation. <laughs> and, and so it develops. And uh, as we become more attuned to what who is speaking around us, it's our own life experiences and mm. conversations we have. You know, you reach a point where you think, oh, that sounds clever. And you mm. work on that. But then it just mm. becomes a song as a vehicle for a clever line or a clever title. Mm. And then you realize it becomes a craft. And mm. going back to that dry, dry stone wall analogy, mm you realise that you have three or four minutes at most to tell a story or make mm. a statement, and it has to fit. Mm. So there's a mechanical element to this as well. The songs have to be burnished and polished, mm. you know, all their burr removed so they fit smoothly together. Mm. So it becomes multi, uh, multi-dimensional mm. in being able to tell a story uh, in terms of being left field. It, it's natural, it's everyday life, but the way mm. you depict it, you know, when they say there's now the strangest folk, yeah. well, all we do is write about the strange folk that we come across. Yeah, yeah. I got an interesting you say about burnishing them, and, and uh, you, 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 even when you're talking, your, your choice of, of words is, is quite lyrical, and, and I think one of the things that strikes me um, is that quite often I go to, I don't do it much these days, I've done anything for 18 months, um, like open mic nights and these sort of people who are just starting to write. And I, I sometimes think that what happens is they come up, they have a chord sequence and, and they, they kind of sing over it. But then two things are sadly missing quite often. One is the fact that they don't have a melody. They have a vague melody, whereas you have a very precise melody when you yeah. when you sing. And also they don't necessarily consider because in a sense your phrasing is quite slow. There's there's no this isn't there's no garbled statements in it. Therefore your 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 timing is very as you say, burnished. It's been it's been carefully worked on. It's not something that you scribble down on the back of an envelope and said, Yeah, that'll do. No, no, they can take months. Yeah. You know, my my influence was ranged from Noel Coward to growing up in the seventies and being influenced by glam rock. So yeah. Bowie and Slade, you know, were kings as far as I was concerned. And and Noel Coward and John Cooper Clark taught yeah. me the craft of songwriting. And I think that's... Smith. Smith was a big influence, Mark E. Smith. Right. But Ed, Ed used to play with Mark Riley's band, The Creepers, and that was the first right. time I realised that you could actually take the piss out of people and make it uh, warm and humorous and loving, mm. but still be sarcastic. So I thought, there's more to it than this. You know, you do have to work at it. You, you can't be lazy about mm. it. It's, it's, I'm, I, I'm quite interested in, in people who are slightly off the wall. And, and, and they're also... Um, I, I, 
it's a personal thing. I, quite a few artists that I like, which who have sustained a career in the music industry, um, but have never become mega mega famous. Um, but have, you know, made a, made a living out of it. People like like Leon Redbone. Um, people like um, do you know Earl Oakin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mr. Um, Trump, later, yeah. That's the one. Yes. Um, and uh, who was the other one I was thinking about the other day? Um, Dan Hicks. Do you know Dan Hicks? No, I'm not familiar with that. No, the American uh, his band was was called Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks, and they were sort of country swing band, mm -hmm. Western swing. Um, but they wrote such wonderful titles as "How Can I Miss You" and "He Won't Go Away." Um, you know, on, on but but very very clever lyrics, mm -hmm. which were you know not just scribbled down and, and garbled out. You know, there mm -hmm. were things that had been clearly worked on, and mm -hmm. as you say, they they, they are they, they might have the phrase like that one for example and, and work at it but then it becomes a complete song and then it is something it's that substantial dry stone wall really yeah and remember there was quite a big movement in the 70s merging out the folk movement um, mm. into humor and so there was a mixture of comedy and well-crafted songs as well and that was also a big influence who do you mean in that context uh, well i'm thinking in particular maybe of uh mike harding yeah and uh, jasper carrot and uh, of course, uh, Billy Connolly. Yeah. And uh, that kind of ties in with our first influence when Ed and I met, in, introduced to Bill Leader at Salford Tech, hmm. who was kind of really the most influential person of the folk revival and recording. Hmm. And, and he introduced us to John Gill, who became hmm. our mentor. Hmm. So we've been lucky and privileged enough to be in this melting pot of people just passing by and spending a bit of time being creative. And so we, we kind of absorb it, really. It's interesting you met, you, you met those, all those people you mentioned. Uh, I, I, I go along wholeheartedly with them. I remember the first time I saw Mike Harding and, and just how, how his, 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 his songs and his storytelling and how they, they, the, the, the emphasis in his performances changed and he became more of a storyteller, also sang. And then Billy Connolly went the, the whole hog. But also, do you, do you think that it's a very um, a very sort of British style of music? I do, actually. Mm. Very much a kind of dance hall, isn't it? And if you think of maybe uh, in the 30s with people like Noel Coward and then the, <clears throat> the amazing craft of, of the song, I, Ivan Avello and people, it, it was people's main entertainment, whether it was at home Mm. on the piano or in, in the concert hall, mm. in the pubs. You know, there's a great tradition of uh, pub singers and piano players and mm. musicians that never really got beyond the street where they lived. Yeah. The, the thing that intrigues me, though, is that it's also the same thing about like the craft of songwriting and the huge influence of the great American songbook, you know, the Gertrudes, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which, which I'm, I'm a, a big fan of. Um, but then in the in in more recent times in the 70s they say we're talking about people like the bonzos people like liverpool scene um you know who, who, were, who were doing something slightly different and and, and but with, which i think that that side of it is quite a, a british thing yeah i don't, yeah, I don't I see it was neil innes really that made me realize uh, i could become a songwriter his mm. uh, program the innes book of records in the 70s I was yeah completely mesmerized by it. But you can write about anything really can i can i just excuse me a minute is that professional <laughs> are we to tell a joke at this stage? <laughs> uh i don't normally dash off camera and do this thing but this you just mentioned neil innes and uh <clears throat> i came across a wonderful quote the other day I might try and find it too. When he was describing how he first met Viv Stanshall, you know, with the, the great British eccentric. Mm. Um, I'll see if I can find it in a minute. Um, okay, should we have another song, do you think? What do you reckon? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Just have a swig. Water, by the way, it's not vodka. <laughs> <clears throat> this is another love song. Um, I, I suppose it's about uh, love being bigger than the sum of its parts. Mm where you kind of walk drunkenly into love is the best way I can describe it, really. 
and it features a chromatic uh, and it's called Love is Blind. When our time's up, we both know there's one of us it's waiting for. Despite our reservations, only ten beds and a basin was the only room not taken in the toilets down the hall. We were dazzling and brave enough, we could both be soft and sometimes super tough. With some trepidation like Columbus with a compass, we discover new locations, some are grand and some are rough. Love is blind, but it may need bifocals, both national or local. Love is blind. Love is blind, blind drunk at some reception, punch drunk on sweet confection. In my mind's wild imagination we look out and go sands and rolling waves there's a seam of gold that rages through our veins turns our whole world a misty blue but it's so plain to me you deserve better than a roadside B&B livers jet setters at the Hilton we'd be wilting away we'll leave the door ajar in our ivory tower is there life on mars or some higher power is this blind faith is this blind drug love Heaven knows when our time's up, we both know there's one of us it's waiting for. Despite our reservations, only twin beds and a basin was the only room not taken in the toilets down the hall. Thank you.
Lovely. Thank you. It's rare to hear people playing chromatic harmonicas as well, I have to say. They're not easy, are they? <laughs> They're not. No, they are not easy. You have to learn how to vibe, hyperventilate quite early on. Then. <laughs> Got some comments in here from um, Christine Lomax, who says, "Love this band." Oh, yes. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Lovely Chris. To see you. Although we can't see you, of course. But <laughs> uh, Caroline Freeman, really enjoying all the songs. Brilliant lyrics. Thank you. So Thank there you go. So um, I've, I've just fa found this this quote I was saying about before, which is um, t talking about because it's, it's it's all to do with that eccentricity, really, when it comes to this sort of humour. I think, and this was the, um, Neil in his his first meeting with Viv Stanshaw, okay? We first met in a big Irish pub in South London, the New Cross Arms. He was quite plump in those days and he was wearing Billy Bunter check trousers, a Victorian frock coat, black coat tails, horrible little oval violet tinted pince glasses. He had a euphonium under his arm and large rubber false ears. And I thought, well, this is an interesting character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> What's not to like? Absolutely. Yeah. There's a song in there. I think. <laughs> yeah, it, but but again, that that humour. I mean, I don't think. I mean, did did the Bonzo Dog humour travel to America? I suspect not. I think I think they struggle. I don't know whether they ever played there, and I think um, <clears throat> they they didn't quite get Monty Python. But I think I mean, this may be a generalisation, but you kind of learn about British humour. Mm. from the outside because it is very distinctive mm. it is it is a trick and i was trying to think about those people i mentioned before and i mean um you know leon redburn is, is, is an amusing guy but in a different way and certainly the um the dan hex lyrics are different but they're, they're they're not as they're not quite as ridiculously wacky as the bonzos for example mm. yeah yeah i mean so it's all a little bit surreal Although some people might say that Zappa was as well, but, but again. Um, yeah, the other thing that struck me about it is that the songs are, you, you, it, they're quite complex. You, you uh, don't sort of work on a sort of, this is the verse, this is the chorus job. Uh, I would say unconventional. <laughs> um, in a way, the, the, the content is actually very simple and the music arrangement is very simple. Yeah. Um, I think the complexity maybe reflects on how we uh, formulate ideas, you know, mm. our cognitive abilities, I think. Uh, unconventional, to say the least, uh, yeah. would be an understatement. <laughs> if there's a hard way to do it, mm. or our own way to do it, we will find that <clears throat> way. So I can remember when we first met Phil, uh, one of the tasks we gave him... Um, we gave him a piece of music to um, write some lyrics to, but he had to sing everything out of tune mm. all the way through, which is no mean task. It's quite hard to do. Mm, very hard, yeah. And he came back after Christmas and we sat down and played this thing straight off and every note was out of tune. It was just miraculous. <laughs> and, we, and we thought, well, if we, if we can work from, from uh, extremes like that, then we can yeah. work you know, with, with more... Content. It's it's true. I mean, it, it's when it's often been said, you know, that the the ability to play something that's out of tune and funny. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, it's yeah. if you listen to somebody like like like, like what, Victor Borger or somebody like that, yeah. who was a master of it, and um, well, Les Dawson, as in Les Dawson, of course, yeah. Um, well, because the, his his ability to select the the, the note that was just absolutely two hundred percent wrong. Yeah. 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 Not just a little bit, but in in completely the 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 wrong scale, the wrong mode. That it, yeah, and it is an art. Well, I mean, considering that Ed and I met in music college, which I think was the first uh, one of the first pop music and recording courses in the country. Mm. So, so I, I left not being able to read music. Mm. So I thought, well, I'm either going to have to try the hard way or give up on the idea completely. Yeah. So that's really been the the, the ethos, really. We we'll mm. just do it the way that suits us rather mm. than conventionally. Mm. Yeah, I mean, software so was was groundbreaking, mm. and still, and still, you know, I, I work with quite a lot of guys who've come out of there, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a good and and it's given it, it it's given music a sort of 
a, a different level of, um, how can I say, acceptance. You know, like when I was a kid, the idea of, you know, if, if you were playing a rock and roll, whatever it was, whatever, whatever my parents would have called it, um, it, it was it was un, it was untutored. It was, you know, it was just something that people did, whereas to, to actually make it suddenly into a, a course you could study at, at the university level, even, you know, made it some some gave it some respectability. Yeah. yeah. It, and, uh, it, it taught us the rudiments of music and how to put things together and, mm. uh, but it doesn't teach your heart. It doesn't teach <clears> your soul. <throat> you know? mm, that's right. And that, that came through jamming and, you mm. know, and, and all the heartaches of, of the early stages. Um, and that's, that's what the essence of the music mm. really is. It, it's got to have feeling to it, you know, mm. rather than just being a piece of music. Well, the fact that you're still doing it together after how many years? Well, 39 years in September, Ed and I will have been writing together, yeah. Man and that's boy. Fan that's fantastic. I don't... Lennon McCartney didn't manage it for that long, did he? No. No, there's, a mo there's a moral there somewhere, I feel. To him, yeah. <laughs> there's a moral to it. So what have you got coming up? Have you got any gigs lined up, apart from the one I'm trying to get for you? Well, we have one in November uh, in at Fuel in Winnington with uh, the picnic area uh, who have been around a long time. They mm. organise monthly gigs and mm. it's going to be the first time we'll have played, unless, of course, we get anything sooner. Mm. For, well, uh, 2019, I think, was the last time the band played together. Mm. We find it hard to get an audience, so it tends to be very small venues, yeah. like little cafes, little bars, where it's quiet enough that people can pay attention and listen and enjoy yeah. it, really. Mm. They tend to be people of our age as well, mm. which does help because they have more concentration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, so, sorry, who will get the, I know Fuel. I've played at Fuel several times. Yeah. Um, picnic area, who's in that? Uh, well, that's Andy Callum and uh, Wayne McDonald, is it? Who... No, I don't um, think Yeah, maybe. They've been, they're kind of from Stockport area, I think, and they, they've been running fuel nights for many years. Mm. Um, it is one of the few places where we get to play. It's quite hard, really, with original music. You either mm. sit in a singer's night or mm. the evening and wait hours to just play a couple of songs. <laughs> yes. Or you be patient and try and find a venue that will like you, really. Yeah. Yeah, or, you try, or you try and organise your own. We've yeah, done a bit of that. Try, yeah, we have organised our own. Phil was involved in booking bands regularly. The problem is, and it's still the same today, 30, 40 years later, yeah. with the kind of attitude of promoters where you have to sell tickets, you really have mm. to pay to play. And yeah. when you have no fan base, yeah. who do you sell tickets to? It is difficult. I mean, the, the, the um, we were in the States four years ago and spent a month over there and played in various places. And one of the things that struck me about it is that, if anything, the situation over there is even worse uh, yeah. in, the, in the sense that nobody gets paid to do gigs until you reach a sort of certain level. But the, the upside of that is that people are used to actually giving money to musicians. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we went, we went to see one band in, in Memphis and the... Um, they were all local musicians. The drummer, um, I was told, told his name and checked it out. And he was actually, he's the current drummer with the, the M, with Booker T and the MGs. And um, phenomenal players. But, and in a really nice venue, big proscenium, an art, arch and everything. But there was still, there was a guitar case on the front of the stage. Yeah. yeah. But there were 20, 10, $50 bills going in, you know? Yeah. yeah. So they, they, they were doing it. They had nothing to start with. But I think in the UK, I mean, certainly when I first started playing in, in folk clubs and things, they used to pass around the pot. But that kind yeah, of yeah. died out at a certain yeah. point. Yeah. Um, well, people, people made living out of um, music before record companies. Mm. Oh, you know, yeah. They, you know, they were they made quite decent livings as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to have got harder, and and of course the the other thing is with um, with Spotify. You know, people yeah. are used to you know the, the actual. Sa it's funny though at the moment that that I think it was last year that the um, <clears throat> sale of of cassettes reached a new yeah. high since that about nineteen ninety three or something like that. Yeah, that, that is amazing, and it's really impressive. I, I love cassettes. We, we all love the 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 sound of cassettes. 
uh, we, we decided we'd put our music on Spotify, mm. even despite musicians being ripped off. And, and mm. it's really almost fraudulent what happens. But without those kind of platforms, our music just doesn't get heard. So yeah. we're leaving yeah. a legacy. We, we have an archive that's available to anyone mm. who wishes to hear it. Mm. There's, I mean, have you tried using Bandcamp? No, I haven't tried Bandcamp. No. Bandcamp is is, a, is an alternative, um, and I, I spoke to the guys there some, some some time ago about this, and they said you can either put a price on per track or per album, or you can just say pay what you like. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys from Bandcamp said to me that most people, the people who do best out of it, are the people who put um, pay what you like, mm -hmm. yeah. which it, it, you know. Oh, hang on, there's something here's a comment here, um, Caroline Freeman. Bandcamp is awesome. There you go. Oh, okay, yeah. we'll check it out. Um, oh, hang on, I've got another comment here. Uh, oh, this is a comment from um, uh, from America. This is somebody, uh, a friend of ours who lives in uh, New York State, um, Mariangelo Damiani, who uh, tunes in regularly. So there you go. So you look, you're both sides of the Atlantic tonight. Oh, How about that? This is our <laughs> biggest audience ever. For what it is. <laughs> Certainly the broadest. Previously, it was the British Legion in Presswick. <laughs> Well, that's brilliant. Um, what do you reckon? Do you think we should do another tune? I mean, I said, when I say we, I use it in the royal sense. Um, would you like to do another song? Uh, another another song? Another tune, yeah, if we have time. You do, you do. Okay. I'm not sure how long this is. Uh, it's about four minutes. Yeah. Now, this is not a love song. In fact, it, you could say it was the opposite, really. And uh, it's about the um, phenomenon of... Um, the internet and uh, the digital revolution, uh, how people communicate now. Uh, I remember for the first time seeing a guy on his mobile phone, I was in the supermarket and he was ringing his partner saying, I'm in the cereal aisle, what was it that you wanted? And I thought, oh, this is really the end of life as we know it. And I was right. Uh, but now people become uh, anonymized on the internet where bullying happens, where you know, uh, far right and far left people have the courage to speak out, but mm. sometimes to other people's detriment. And, and in a way, it's a benign platform that makes us all preachers, great and small, mm. which is what the song is called. Excellent, excellent. One, two, three, four. It's a funny old world in the blink of an eye. Dark secrets reveal more dirty laundry Each layer we peel from the seed of a lie But so by a troll now turns a blind right eye Though it offends thee Indelibly marked, imprinted in time Where reductionists hyperlink footnotes We airbrush the truth and falsifying news we like the lie enough to believe it a manifesto of rumors and whispers cultivated by movers and shakers worshiping the phone like a traveling altar hyper vigilant checking are we falter it's a funny old world in the blink of an eye, dark secrets reveal our dirty laundry. Each layer we peel from the seed of a lie that's sown by a troll now turns a blind right eye, though it offends thee. Yet the big iPhone makes us all demigods guides us through the fog to the bright lights in our ideal world where our online presence makes us all irresistible and sexy makes us preach from the rooftops to dungeons makes us want to attack with a truncheon makes the rest of the world look your way and rummage through the skeletons in your closet it's a funny old world
innocence abroad Where myths and legends rise and fall Its power leaves us wanting more Fake news becomes folklore To preachers great and small All preachers great and small all preachers great and small All preachers great and small Preachers great and small, all preachers great and small, all preachers great and small, all preachers great and small. Excellent, excellent, all preachers great and small, great line. Well, thanks, chaps. That's been absolutely brilliant. Um, do yes, keep me posted as to when you said you're playing at Fool. That's we just down. Yes. We'll that's just down the road from from me. I shall. Uh, I shall definitely come down and see you there. And um, yeah, so Phil, Phil, and Eddie, and Henrik, Henrik, from wherever he may be. Um, thanks for taking part. And um, thanks for inviting us. Yeah. Well, well, my pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah. And, um, We're also available for gigs in Italy and America. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we become famous from this role, then we're going to blame you for that. Okay, I'll take the responsibility. Okay, no problem. I've got, hang on, I've got some more comments coming in here. Oh, loud applause from Christine Lomax, a great hey. session. Um, Catherine Phillips, great session. Oh, that's um, Naomi Wilson. Yeah, oh, bloody I've hell. Loved, yeah, it says, I've loved tun tuning in tonight. Great chat and brilliant songs. Takes me back to drinking red wine around my dad and Chris's kitchen table with blazing snowmen on the stereo. Yeah. <laughs> you go, like you, you're inciting nostalgia now as well. That's brilliant. So it's been an absolute nostalgia, pleasure. Nostalgia isn't what it used to be, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> you fit me to it, you bugger. <laughs> So, um, yeah, best of luck with it all. And do keep in touch and keep us all posted. Um, well, I think we've told where... Let's put the banner up again so people know where they can find out about what you're doing. There you go. Um, yeah, you can find you can find the, the, the Blazing Snowman on Facebook and on Spotify. And shortly you'll probably be able to find him on Bandcamp as well. Um, yeah, in your front room before too long. <laughs> Yeah, there's this. There's, I think there's a lot more scope for home concerts with a band like yours. To be yeah. honest, I think it'd be a good thing to do. So, thank you guys. Look after yourselves. Thank you. You're welcome. And thanks see you again us. soon. Okay. Cheers, guys. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Ah, oh, that was brilliant. Uh, what a great discovery. And I say discovery, discovery for me. I didn't, I didn't discover them. Um, so that's it for this week from me. Um, I've just had a message through confirming who my guest is for next week. It's a gentleman called John Clark. Um, who also has a sort of uh, slightly left field approach to like lyric writing. Um, maybe this is a theme we should develop. So I shall be here next week. Um, if you're in the Leeds area um, on Friday at 6.30, I shall be playing a solo gig at the Seven Arts Centre in um, Chapel Allerton. So if you're around, um, do drop in and say hello. And failing that, um, hopefully I shall see you again next week. And in the meantime, look after yourselves and stay safe. Bye. <laughs>